Dom, when was the first one? Nicolau, you were in Sheffield. Come on. 2013. So this will be the fourth. The fourth gas in process. Summer school. Um, and uh, welcome to Sheffield. Um, so what we normally do, the tradition of these schools, is to do two introductions. So typically I start by doing an introduction, and then we have a different introduction. And that's because I think, uh, certainly when I learned Gaussian processes, I found it helpful hearing as many times, as many people introducing them as possible. Because it's a slightly different way of modelling. It's the correct way of modelling. <laughs> Unfortunately, you've been indoctrinated with other bad ways of modelling. So, but it takes a while, as we know, bad habits take a while to overcome. Um, so... Uh, uh, that's the reason for doing it and also it's evolved into it's very nice because I am always doing one but then I kind of say the same thing and there's probably who, who's watched videos of me introducing Gaussian process online you see there you go you can be utterly bored uh, so I so because of that I keep on saying slightly different things I suppose and also then I know uh, that we've got excellent expert introductions uh, today Jeremy Oakley um, to sort of tidy up all the all the bits that I've missed um, okay so um uh, just to say a little bit about these models, I mean, these models are, people normally talk about sort of, a, I suppose, Kalman is 1960 with Kalman filters, but that's, Kalman smooth is uh, not even Kalman, so they come after that. But there's this wonderful, uh, this isn't the original copy of the book, but I got this printed, it's uh, Sur la compensation de quelques erreurs quasi systématiques par la méthode de moins carré, which I think means on the compensation of some uh, uh, quasi, si almost systematic errors by the method of least squares. So um, this is uh, by a, um, a guy called Torvald Thiele. It was written originally in um, Danish, but I felt I had more chance with the French. There's a French copy, so you can find it on Google Books, but I just got this uh, printout made. And it's actually the first sort of um, description of uh, Gaussian smoothing, and it's uh, 1880, so 80 years before... Um, before uh, Kalman. And it actually, the example it uses is perhaps you've got observations with a telescope and there's something systematically wrong with the telescope, right? So it's, it, you've got this constant uh, distortion rather than independent errors. And that's what he uses to motivate it. So that's a wonderful book. An even more wonderful book is this, um, this book which I bought online because I got a copy out of the library and I bought a copy online uh, via Amazon, I think. Um, and then rather nicely inside, it says uh, Statistical Laboratory, University of Manchester. So I apologize to the University of Manchester if this found it uh, by illicit means, but I suspect they sold off their library or something. Um, it's called Random Processes and Automatic Control, and it's by a guy called uh, Hal Lanning. Um, and uh, it's a book which is filled with material on Gaussian processes. Now, the, the fascinating thing about this is I think it's 19, yeah, 1956 this book. It's filled with Gaussian processes and it's, uh, it's about control systems engineering. Now Hal Lanning at the time, uh, he was at the instrumentation laboratory at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Um, now he actually turned out to be the person that designed the first real-time operating system for the lunar landing module. So he built a priority operating system, the one that ensured that when, the, uh, when they had the error that it, uh, on the landing, it, it ran the correct program. It ran the program that was going to land the module rather than some other irrelevant program. He designed that. Um, but this is, so he became very well known as an expert in digital control. Um, but this is all about continuous systems and Gaussian processes. And it's fascinating because there's a load of ideas in here that are things that we thought we invented within the last 10 years. But of course, what happened was continuous systems uh, took second place to digital systems. I mean, 1960 is Kármán. So the actual lunar landings, uh, the navigation to the moon, uh, they used Kármán filters to get there. They actually used something called square root propagation. Anyone heard of that? It was invented to get, because they had 16 bits of precision. So it was invented square root propagation to get the thing to the moon, because they had a lack of precision. Uh, 16 bits, still pretty good, better than like what we had like 20 years later with our 8-bit computers. But they needed to do square root propagation to do that. So people moved very much, um, I guess, with the sort of the going to the moon towards digital signal processing and digital computers. Um, and, and there was a big forgetting about these sort of systems within uh, the signal processing community. Um, but there's actually um, someone who's really good, although he doesn't cover it much, but does a lot of work in Gaussian processes um, nowadays. 
uh, is Simo Saka. So I've been really talking about smoothing and filtering systems, and this book is excellent, Bayesian Filtering and Smoothing. If you want to know about those systems and how they interrelate, it's from the filtering perspective. It's not from a sort of Gaussian process perspective. But Simo's work in general is really taking us back to sort of relations between these filtering systems and these continuous systems. And why? Because we have much faster computers now. So we can do linear algebra very quickly. Now, one of the previous introductions that Philip Hennix did, he did a really nice good job of explaining one motivation for Gaussian processes is that they are entirely linear algebra. And so now I say that every time because I thought that's a really nice way of putting it. Linear algebra is like the modern thing we can do fast on computers. Yeah, I mean, that's what GPUs are doing fast for us. That's what uh, processes are designed to do, LAPAC, BLAS. We've got modules to run linear algebra for us. And inference in Gaussian processes is purely linear algebra. So just as previous generations, so this is like Hal Lanning. Actually, and I've looked up where the HAL 9000 is named after him. It's not clear. Some references say it might be, um, but uh, it probably, maybe it wasn't. Um, so this guy, HAL Lanning, the reason he moved towards digital control, because it was the practical mathematical algorithmic approach for the time. But nowadays, I would say Gaussian processes are very practical, and we're trying to make them even more practical. So that's my sort of long-winded introduction. Um, now, I'm trying to give you a sort of bit of a historical perspective and also give you a hint. I won't talk a great deal about, sometimes we have CMO talk, there's talks online from CMO relating um, Gaussian processes to filters. And I really love that area, but I'm not expert in it. Rich Turner's also doing work in that area and I think spoke at the last school on related things, if I remember correctly. Um, but from the machine learning perspective, and you're gonna hear a statistical perspective later from Jeremy, so I won't say too much about that. Uh, the people that really introduced them to machine learners were Carl Rasmussen and Chris Williams with this book. I mean, there was a community of us working on them, but they got popularized in machine learning for this book. And this book is still, I would say, one of the best references if you're coming from a machine learning background. Although publishers keep asking people to write new books in Gaussian processes, so m maybe someone will say yes one day. So I would advise taking a look at that book. Um, now, what I'm going to do is uh, try and introduce these things. Um, by looking at Gaussian the Gaussian density and then looking at basis function models, which is one way of looking at Gaussian processes. Um, so it always strikes me that when I was at school, I hated, I guess we called it the normal distribution, I suppose. I hated the normal distribution. It seemed so uninteresting. I really didn't like statistics because it just seemed to be the easiest bit of maths because you had to remember. Okay, the mean formula was quite easy to remember, but standard deviation, had a few complications in it, but all you had to do is remember this formula. We were given little tables of numbers and you had to punch them into your calculator. It just seemed like, well, when are we gonna do some maths? So I think it's ironic that the bit of maths I hated the most is the one I spend all my time doing. And the reason is because I think most people, when they think of a Gaussian, they're obsessed with the mean. Now, what you'll see we do is we sort of, I mean, the mean can be included and it's often included in some applications, but the main thing from a Gaussian process perspective that I'm going to try and communicate is about the covariance. And multivariate Gaussians, that's where they get very interesting when you start thinking about the covariance rather than the mean. So it's a, it's a standard sort of PDF and it has this nice uh, sort of bell-shaped curve. What I love about this is this has become so predominant now that it's expected that if you produce exam results, your students should uh, conform to a bell-shaped curve. It's actually very easy to do. All you have to do is ask them lots and lots of questions, and it will naturally come out as a bell-shaped curve. I know because I tried it. Uh, and my, my course went from being bimodal to being... Uh, so it, it's a lot of work on the marking, wasn't it, people? <laughs> These guys did all the marking. But it totally turns from what is often a bimodal into a bell-shaped curve. If you look at any individual assignment, you get a bimodality. The students, some are doing better than others. But if you add all those things up very quickly after, what, seven assignments? After seven assignments, we recovered a bell-shaped curve. Um, of course, the students at the top of the curve are still the best ones because they're the ones that are con consistently scoring well. And the students at the bottom are the ones that are consistently scoring badly. And the ones in the middle are some assignments getting 100%, some assignments they're getting nothing. Yeah. So, I mean, that is the way to get things bell-shaped. You just assess an enormous amount. It, it doesn't do wonders for your scores in terms of your feedback and everything else, I'd say, but, but it makes them happy at the exam board. Um, so, uh, that's very important property. 
of Gaussian variables. I mean, what I'm talking about there is, of course, is the central limit theorem. Now, the central limit theorem, um, in the case of Gaussians, if you sum Gaussian random variables, of course, they stay Gaussian. They don't become something else. Now, this is something that I think when I was at school or at university, um, I never sort of thought of this as unusual. They just present that as a fait accompli. You know, that's, here it is. If you add these random variables together, then they stay in the same class of distributions. And that seems quite, well, why wouldn't they? But of course, most distributions don't. Most distributions tend towards Gaussian. So most things, if you add random variables together, they move towards Gaussian. So it's a very unusual characteristic, this uh, sum of Gaussian being Gaussian. Um, and of course, the sum of Gaussian variables is if we have individuals which are sampled with a mean and a variance like so, then the sum of those variables is distributed as um, a sum, a uh, Gaussian with the mean being equal to the sum of the means and the variance equal to the sum of the variances. Now, this turns out to be super useful and important. Um, it actually turns out to be pretty important that it's the sum of the variances and not the sum of the standard deviations as well, if, uh, if you, mathematically, to sort of show that actually taking averages of noisy variables does improve things. But I won't go too much into that. But that's one of the main uh, properties of the Gaussian. There's another property which is, yeah, so as the sum increases of non-Gaussian finite variants, they have to be finite variance variables, you also get a Gaussian. So that's a reason why Gaussian processes are sometimes important. Like um, this morning, I was a bit late running, uh, coming here, because everything was going wrong. Um, like uh, my bicycle seat broke on Sunday morning, and I was going to take another bicycle. And uh, I was getting the kids ready for school. And as I rode my new bicycle out, then it had a flat tire, so I had to get it back in. I have another bike, so I switched over the tires. And so they made all these things, and I was thinking, well, the sum of those variables has to be Gaussian. So why is it when I'm running particularly late? Well, I just decided that it's because my wife is in Portugal um, today, and that's a discrete variable that makes a major change to my life, because I'm doing a lot more with the kids, because she normally does a whole load of stuff. And of course, that affects things. So if you've got a major single change, you don't get Gaussian results. You, get, you come late. But if you, um, if you have lots of small things adding up, going wrong, then typically you would still expect to see Gaussian noise. And that's the central limit theorem tells us that. Who was it who proved the first version of the central limit theorem? Anyone know? Gee, terrible. First version of the central limit theorem. Pardon? I think it was Laplace, wasn't it? Laplace, yeah. The answer for every question who did what in maths is, is Laplace. <laughs> who, um, who invented the Gaussian distribution? Laplace. Yeah, actually, um, Demoivre also invented it separately as an approximation to the binomial, but Laplace didn't know about that. Uh, Gauss, Gauss credits it to Laplace. So this other property, though, is less, is less unique to Gaussians. So... Scaling a Gaussian also leads to a Gaussian. Now, that's not unique to a Gaussian. Scaling a lot of variables keeps you within the same distribution family. But those two properties are the important ones I wanted to highlight because they're what means that playing with Gaussians is playing with linear algebra. Because linear algebra is just multiplying and summing, right? So if you, sum, if you do a linear algebraic operation on a Gaussian random variable, because it just a matrix multiplication, because it just involves scaling and then summing together, it all stays within the same family. And that's why inference in Gaussian processes is so trivial. So one of the things I never was communicated as a student, and I kind of started, evolved into teaching it myself. So it may be somewhere taught other than by me, but um, I don't know where. Uh, let me just see that I've got, I've got the multivariate properties. Is things like this model become very easy. So we're going to use a lot of linear algebraic representation. So if I've got a vector w and I say w is equal to a matrix times x and then I say x is drawn from a multivariate Gaussian which I haven't yet introduced it's a, with a, um, a spherical covariance well I immediately know that y is drawn from multivariate Gaussian and because of properties because this is a set of independent Gaussian variables and all I'm doing with a matrix multiplication is scaling them and then adding scaling and then adding then I end up with Y being distributed as a Gaussian as well. And as I, I won't really prove this, but you, know, you can go through it yourself. Well, in this case, it's immediately possible to write down that Y is drawn from a Gaussian with zero mean because the mean should be W times the mean, which is zero in this case. 
and covariance W, W transpose, because the covariance will be of the form W sigma W transpose, where that covariance is denoted sigma. Now, that's a one-liner. Now, in Bayesian inference, what I'm actually doing here is I'm saying I've got a likelihood, probability of Y given X, comma, W, is given by this. And then I'm saying X is drawn from a Gaussian. So that's a P of X. So I'm actually then deriving P of Y. This is P of Y, the probability distribution over Y. That's the marginalization. That requires the sum rule. So P of Y given X, P of X, it's a multivariate integral. This is the bane of Bayesian inference. This is the bane of Bayesian inference because it's a multivariate high dimensional integral. And they're difficult to solve. People spend their lives solving these integrals. But in the Gaussian case, they're trivial. And this is why Gaussians are very nice to play with. Of course, they're not always the right model, but that's why they're very analytic because of that very unusual property which derives from these two. So um, the sort of things we want to do with a Gaussian process turns out to be we want to do things like regression modeling. Now, I think it's important. Who's here from a statistics background? Yeah. And who here is from a machine learning background? And who here is from, I don't know, miscellaneous other? <laughs> what, 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 what background are you from? I'm actually doing formal methods in robotics. Formal methods in robotics. Yeah. Theoretical physics. Theoretical physics. Yeah, so this makes notation and philosophy quite a difficult sort of thing. Because actually, the maths is the same for everyone, but the language and the motivations differ individually. So some stuff becomes quite confusing and you can end up with a lot of arguments about why things are in different ways. Le regression is a term from which field? Statistics, yeah. So who, who's, who comes up with that term? Francis Galton. Yeah, it's a term from, a, it's a term about a phenomenon, right? So in a lot of fields you might call that curve fitting or you might call it, I don't know what you'd call it, um, but uh, it's a bit weird that it's, I mean, regression is such a strange term. But uh, I'm using it here to mean fitting lines to curves. So that's a sort of standard uh, thing we might do with a linear function. And then I like to use this example of the sort of things. This is a very common thing we want to do in, in any of these fields. We want to get some data and replace the data with a function that fits it. In fact, I should have done this in the introduction. What we're doing here is we're focusing this school on uncertainty quantification. So uncertainty quantification is exactly that art. I mean, it's but quantifying uncertainty as well. So you've got some sort of system, and you want to replace that system with a surrogate model, which actually gives you additional information about uncertainty. Um, now, the example I, uh, some of the examples of, sort of regression in, say, machine learning is, say, prediction of the quality of some meat given some spectral information. Now, an example that's from uh, Sheffield, which is... Um, did you ever work on this? No, it's Tony O'Hagan and uh, other people. Is calibration of the C14 uh, isotope curve. So you get radiocarbon dating. Um, and uh, that's based on assumptions about the level of carbon-14 in the atmosphere that is, aren't correct. But you can find the correct values by lining up tree rings over a long period of time. So you've got the, a, tr a ground truth. And so uh, work done in Sheffield using Gaussian processes, actually, um, was the C14 calibration curve. Take take this, the carbon-14 age and map it to the real age. Um, oh, I suppose Go isn't done. I've had this slide for a long time, but um, I suppose I should update that because they didn't do really this in the um, alpha goal. But predict quality of different game moves is a regression problem. So if you've got the score of some quality of different game moves like backgammon or Go, give an expert rated training data. They did use expert rated training data, but I don't think they did a regression model. Maybe they did at some point. But, um, but I like to think of these things. I mean, I like to sort of think of the most simplistic thing we can do as this, because 13 year olds end up studying um, this, this formula, y equals mx plus c. It's um, got some characteristics. We've got some response variable that is uh, related to some covariate, and then it's got two parameters. And the parameters have sort of some sort of meaning here of a gradient and an offset. Now, the interesting thing, if you go back to, say, Laplace, this is the sort of question he was worried about. He said, OK, so they were doing, I mean, it's a great time because they're looking at astronomy, and they're looking at um, how they can use maths with astronomy. They're trying to find out orbits of planets or comets or whatever. Um, and 
they, it's very close to today in many respects. They've got data and they've got models, right? And they want to combine them. But one of the things that they came across was this idea that um, if you've got two points, you can fit this straight line right through. You've got the, you know, I think I've even got it on the next slide. You can compute um, uh, what M is and what C is given the two points. But actually, it's an interesting thing to realize that for them, it wasn't obvious what you should do when you've got a third point. Like, it didn't write, oh, immediately. I mean, what do we do when we've got a third point? What do you learn at high school to do? You want to say? Least squares, yeah. So it's interesting, right? So the compensation de quelque erreur quasi systematic par la méthode de moins carré. Moins carré is French for least squares. And I guess it's a Legendre who coined that term. Um, the least squares. You do a least squares fit. But Laplace had worked on it a long time before that, and he didn't think that that was the answer. He was much more. So the, the reason for least squares, if you read the paper, isn't sort of particularly well motivated from a modeling perspective. But Laplace did think about this carefully from a modeling perspective. So actually, just as a re side remark, and I quite like this one, one of the things they tried doing, um, and uh, I read Stigler on this, and he talks about this, so he's an interesting reader if you're more interested in the details, is they, they fitted all the different possible curves or lines. I mean, here I've done lines, but if you could, in, what they were often doing was trying to fit um, planetary orbits so they had basis functions. So all the possible curves uh, to the data. And then they tried to select one that summarized those three. So they sort of said, OK, well, which one of these is the correct fit? They sort of had a sense that one of them would be correct and the others might be incorrect, right? They didn't naturally want to average, which is what we would try and do. Least squares actually leads to averaging. Um, and they would do things like try and find the median fit. So they'd line up all the fits and then define some form of median fit. It's difficult to get an ordering in multiple dimensions and then try and extract that fit, which is sort of interesting. I mean, sort of, it does seem sensible to try and do things like that. OK, so the reason is that this is difficult is because, of course, it's an overdetermined system. We've got three equations and only two parameters that are missing. Now, the person I said as before who solved this is Laplace. I think he's great. He's like my favorite uh, because, uh, I don't know, you just read loads of stuff by Laplace. And I mean, I can't read French very well, but it's just, he's just really impressive. And he works in so many fields. And he survived into his 80s, like through three revolutions and became a count. And yeah, must have been an amazing guy. So um, my favorite thing that he said is actually, um, well, is, is not this thing that he's famous for saying. So this is, a, this is known as Laplace's demon. Who's heard of Laplace's demon? Yeah. So it's, it's a very ironic thing. So it's, here, it's a bit too small. So here, I'm going to try my French again. Who hears French? So you love my accent. <laughs> Nous devons donc envisager la tête présente de l'univers comme le fait de son état antérieur et comme la cause de celui qui le suivre. How, how it okay? Probably a bit like a French Canadian or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's agreement there. Okay, but I've got the English translation here, and it says, we ought then to regard the present state of the universe as the effect of its anterior state and of the cause of the one which is to follow. Um, now, David Applebaum disagreed with me when I said this, but I would claim that's the Markov property, but he's a probabilist, so he would, he would claim that probably this, um, that from an engineer's perspective, that's the Markov property. And he's writing this, I think, in the early 19th century. So that's about uh, 60 years before Markov. Given for one instance an intelligence which could comprehend all the forces by which nature is animated and the respective situation of the beings who compose it, an intelligence sufficiently vast to submit these data to analysis, it would embrace in the same formula the movements of the greatest bodies of the universe and those of the lightest atom. Now be careful here, this is interesting because uh, Boltzmann uh, died extremely frustrated because no one ever accepted his model of the atom. So uh, this is before people believe in atoms actually. So you have to be careful when you read these things because you tend to project modern thinking onto them, but it's quite a fun thing to do because it's amazingly. For it, nothing would be uncertain and the future of the past would be present to its eyes. And then, okay, what's often not quoted is the human mind offers in the perfection which has been able to give astronomy a feeble idea of this intelligence. Now, what I didn't say is, so this is known as Laplace's demon and it's known as, um, it's discussed by philosophers, it's the mechanistic model of the universe. And... Uh, Everyone says, oh, yeah, how foolish, we could never do this. I mean, in the end, quantum effects, I suppose, mean theoretical physics. It doesn't happen. But, you know, from my engineer's perspective, they don't come into it. 
from my perspective, this is true, actually. This is true. I, I'm with Laplace. Um, but I'm also with Laplace on another point that everyone fails to point out. So this is sort of, I mean, there's all sorts of things in here. There's a computational challenge, which is something as we get into probabilistic numerics and uncertainty quantification we're worrying about today. Um, there's sufficiently vast intelligence. Um, but the challenge that Laplace is, the ironic thing is, this is page four in a book called A Philosophical, Philosophical Essay on Probabilities. And what he says here is, um, for it, nothing would be uncertain and the future of the past would be present in his eyes. So this is a bit strange that people are quoting someone who's writing a book on probabilities and the main quote is about determinism. So something you should be a little bit suspicious. And what you will never see written, which I find bizarre, I'm the only one I've heard say it, I hear myself say it a lot, is that two pages later, this is what he goes on to say. The curve described by a simple molecule of air or vapor is regulated in a manner just as certain as the planetary orbits. The only difference between them is that which comes from our ignorance. Probability is relative in part to this ignorance, in part to our knowledge. So this is his point, that you cannot know everything. You can't know about the curve of a molecule of air. He doesn't know molecules exist, actually, but... Um, Anyway, he's speculating, right? He's talking about the unknown, that there are unknown things that you cannot deal with. And that probability is the mechanism for dealing with that. And that's what I utterly believe. This is not written by Bayes. It's a much nicer um, framing of this idea than Bayes writes. And actually, Richard Price writes most of the stuff that is, in, is comprehensible in introducing Bayes' letter. This is an idea coming from Laplace that you should use probability to deal with uh, these um, lacking and uncertainties. And this is how Laplace proposed dealing with this challenge. Laplace said, well, what's going on is you've got uncertainty about the world. You've got a model of the way you think things happen, but your model is an abstraction. It's a simplification of the world, right? Y equals mx plus c. No one believes in that unless you generate, you know, even a hook. I think in physics, in, for Hooke's law, you have to buy special springs. So you know when you did Hooke's law at school and you put weights on and you measured the displacement? If you try that for a normal spring, it doesn't work. Basically, the very, very expensive springs they make in order to do Hooke's law to get a linear response. You know, very few things are as, as simple as that. Um, and what Laplace said is, okay, so what's going on is that there's a difference, there's an unobserved difference between what I see and uh, what my model says. Now, in statistics, we would call that the residual. But of course, he didn't think of it so much. In other areas, we might call it the noise. Right? There's different names for this. In numerical analysis, they call noise something else, which can be very confusing. But this was Laplace's fundamental idea. You introduce, well, in some areas, you might call them slack variables. But you introduce a new variable. And then you make an assumption about how that variable is distributed. So you make a Gaussian assumption for that variable. Now, the interesting thing is Laplace did all the work on that, thinking about that. He also then did a load of work on, um, uh, is it Laplace's principle of indirection or something? It's like a maximum entropy principle on trying to put as little information into what sh that should be as possible because you haven't modeled it. But it was actually left to Gauss to say, try using uh, the normal distribution for these, and then you get least squares. And, and Gauss claims priority over Legendre because he claims to use that to... Uh, predict series, which is another story. But what I find interesting about that is his motivation for doing this is very much, I've got these sort of things and something's missing and I need to put, I mean, that thing should be knowable, right? You can see from the text, that thing is he believes it's a deterministic thing. In fact, in astronomy, a lot of that is going to be driven by the movement of molecules of air on a larger scale than a single molecule because of turbulence in the atmosphere and everything else is going to give you observation error. But he's sort of saying there's going to be some distribution over that. And then Gauss says, well, that should be a Gaussian density. But he didn't call it a Gaussian density. In fact, he credits it to Laplace. So the beautiful thing about this is, to my mind, is, um, I mean, if you're a statistician, there's sort of generations of arguments about whether you should do this. But it just seems natural when you start modeling and sort of say, well, what about the converse situation? of two unknowns and one observation. So you've got some observation, y, which you're relating to some other observation, x, and you've got two parameters to fit. Now, the nice thing about this is you can only fit this if you make an assumption, perhaps, about uh, what 
C might be, because you can compute M given C. So if I compute C being equal 1.75, I can compute M as follows. So basically, any, if I make a conditioning assumption on C, I can compute a distribution over M. But the really nice thing is, if I assume a distribution for C, just like Gauss was assuming and Laplace was suggesting you assume a distribution for those missing slack variables, then you get a distribution over your solutions. Now, Gauss's idea leads you to one set of parameters, a single point estimate of parameters. This idea here leads you to a distribution over possible values for M and if you, with C, a joint distribution over values for M and C. And they would have, as far as I can understand, seen no difference, no inconsistency between that. They did not distinguish between, as some people do, between genuinely stochastic variables and um, sort of things that you should know. That's a Fisherian perspective. So I like to use that term instead. Don't talk about, if you like this perspective, you're just normal. If you don't like this perspective, you're Fisherian, which is a weird cult of people that believe that something such as stochasticity exists. Um, so the nice thing about uncertainty quantification, I mean, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to build models that include the uncertainty in them, uncertainty about the parameters. And uncertainty quantification, what we're very often trying to do is, um, we can't do this in very complex models because they don't have these nice properties of the Gaussian. But we can sometimes replace those complex models with a surrogate model. And a very commonly used one is a Gaussian process, which is why we're bringing these two things together. And hopefully that will make sense uh, over we go through the next few days. Using this function that we're getting out of here, this is a Gaussian process, but it's a simple one, um, as a surrogate for something else we're interested in. So how am I doing? It's going too slow, probably. Not going too slow. Going fast, but saying too much. Um, so uh, OK, so one of the things that we tend to do in uh, statistics or machine learning is we build linear models of this form, multivariate linear models. These are the foundational models for a lot of areas. In statistics, we would denote this parameter w as beta. And I think that's really useful to use that distinction. Initially, I was like, oh, damn, stupid different notations. Actually, statisticians think very differently about these parameters. In machine learning, we use w. And that's because it's a weight, a neural network weight, which is not a great motivation for a parameter. But um, in stats, they use beta. Now, I think what I think is a good convention is go ahead and use beta if you care about the value of that parameter, if it's something you want to know, like um, the rate of increase in disease with socioeconomic status. Right? That's the sort of thing a statistician will, will want to do. Um, have a parameter that has an interpretation. If your parameter has an interpretation and you care about it, call it beta. If your parameter is just part of a predictive model and you don't really care what value it takes, call it W. And that's very often in the case in machine learning. And that's a big difference between machine learning and statistics. Motivationally, in statistics, normally you care about the value. You're normally trying to fit a model to care out about the value. And that leads to a bunch of different ways than that statisticians will use these models versus machine learning people. In machine learning, we only care about what the prediction is. Um, OK, so um, what we do need is a prior over W if we're going to do the same here. So we've got a bunch of missing values here. And then so that introduces the multivariate Gaussian density. Now, I don't like the, the sort of sum notation. I like little inner product matrix notation. So I tend to write these models like this because it makes the Gaussian inference much easier when you use the sort of tricks I spoke about earlier. So um, typically. I mean, I'm going to assume sort of background knowledge here. Typically, we're looking for, to apply Bayes' rule in these places. Bayes' rule is just so not a rule. I mean, it's just the product rule. I mean, it's, it just gives it an authority that is not even merited. If I just put that on that side, it's the product rule, right? It's the product rule plus the ability to do algebra. I mean, its implications are massive, but it's not really a rule. I mean, it's, sometimes you need the sum rule, of course, as well. And that turns out to be the difficult bit. The sum rule of computing this, P of y, the thing I wrote down trivially here because of Gaussian properties, that turns out to be the difficult but getting the marginalization constant. But um, it's not really, I mean, yeah. I'm Bayesian, but I'm anti-Bayes. I don't like the term Bayesian. So what we're typically trying to do in, in, in Bayesian inference is we have these priors. We're combining them with a likelihood. So in this case, I've got one observation of y given m. I've got a prior over c. And then I combine the two by multiplication 
It's very complicated. So the prior says that C is this, and the, the likelihood, the data says that C should be this. So the two multiply, and I get a posterior, which is why posterior distribution for C has this complicated root. For a Gaussian, it's trivial and very amenable to computation. So the reason why it's trivial is because the multiplication of the prior and the likelihood, both being Gaussian, leads to this form here. So we end up with an exponentiated quadratic call. We're getting a quadratic form of the Gaussian there. And that's one of the reasons, because Gaussians have this form, that's the reason they're so amenable to doing all these sort of things in uh, um, Gaussian processes. So what I wanted to do is just talk about how we're going to do that in the multivariate case and make a couple of points about Gaussians. So let's assume we've got a distribution over people's heights and weights in this room. So Gaussian distributions for heights and weights. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to sample from that distribution. And I'm sampling from height, and then I sample independently from weight. And that's a valid way of getting something multivariate. So that's what I'm sort of showing you here. I'm pulling out those samples. Now those samples are not correlated, right? They're just sample from one and then sample from the other. But that's not a very interesting way of doing a multivariate distribution. But I want to motivate the multivariate Gaussian by starting with that point. So in reality, um, oh, what's the guy's name? He's one of the earliest statisticians invented the idea of body mass. Like he predates mathematical statistics. Ketelet invented the idea of body mass index, uh, which, which tries to relate the fact, um, tries to get an index which is less dependent so it divides height into weight so the taller you are the heavier you are and it's got some quadratic which is weird because you'd think it'd be cubic uh, you can read lots about whether it's a good measure or not but in, in reality what you would expect is this a correlation between height and weight so the first Gaussian distribution is independent so it actually looks like a ball or it would look like an axis aligned sausage for correlated Gaussians and these are the real things that interest me correlated Gaussians are really interesting um, you expect like, light people to be shorter and heavy people to be taller over average. It's not general because some people you know, are a little bit big boned. Um, now, if you look at the marginal distributions, what I've done here is I've actually set the marginals. I've not put numbers, but I have actually set the marginals to have the same width as the marginals looking in each direction. right? So the interesting, the first thing to think about physically with a Gaussian, when you think about, I'm trying to give you the intuitions of a Gaussian. This, so I should have said, sorry, this is one contour from a Gaussian density in two dimensions. So this is supposed to be a hill coming out of the plane. Now the marginals come from looking down the axis at that hill. So the marginal distribution over H comes from just projecting this thing onto this axis here and projecting onto this axis here. So these two marginals are the same as before, but the conditionals um, won't be the same because of this correlation. Because if it's particularly high or particularly low, you get the samples coming out in a different place. Now, the way I like to think of the generation of a Gaussian distribution is by saying, OK, well, let's assume for the start that we've got a multivariate distribution and two things are independent, right? Now, if you multiply two distributions that are Gaussian together, because they have this exponentiated quadratic form, you get this summing inside here. And then the product of the normalizations outside, right? So because it's multiplying of two exponents, it's the sum of the two quadratics. Now, of course, you can then have something that is clearly a Gaussian because it's an exponentiated quadratic itself. But what I want to do is rewrite that in this sort of little matrix form. So I've rewritten it. So W and H are a vector. Mu1 and Mu2 is a vector. And then we've got a diagonal distribution over them. OK, so these are the variances as a sorry, diagonal matrix here. Um, and it's inverted to make sure that we're dividing, right? Now that is starting to look a little bit like a multivariate Gaussian. So what we'll do is we'll rewrite that as W and H are now a vector Y. Uh, the me their means is a vector mu, and that diagonal variance of sigma squared is a diagonal matrix D. So we can get a correlated version by rotating that space. So what I want you to go back to is sort of conceptually, what if our axes were aligned in this way? That's actually the principal axes of the ellipse. If our axes were aligned in this way, we would be back to the independent case. So another way of thinking about that is that a correlated Gaussian isn't rotated independent Gaussian. 
So if we do that, I'm rotating y and I'm rotating mu. A rotation doesn't actually affect the normalization because I'm just spinning that ellipse round conceptually, right? So there's no effect on the normalization. I've less that as before. A rotation of this space then allows me to pull this r in here. And one of the things I think is probably, I don't know, you teach it over a few years and you start trying to think what are the important lessons you're trying to get across. And I guess one important lesson to get across is different ways of thinking of a covariance matrix or a Gaussian density or so on and so forth, to get the intuition for what you're trying to do. And this is how I'm trying to introduce things now. What we're going to say is we're going to define this matrix here, which was a diagonal matrix rotated on either side, to be a covariance matrix. So the C inverse is given as R D minus 1 R transpose. So that means C itself is this. Because this is a rotation matrix, why is this so? Because if I put R transpose R, I get the identity. D times D minus 1 would be the identity. And R R transpose is also the identity. So that gives me C is of that form. So that also turns out that the determinant of this matrix with a rotation is the determinant of C. So that's a property of determinants. So you get the covariance, the multivariate Gaussian, this form, which is now of the form of a vector times a matrix inverted times a vector by conceptually thinking of two independent axes that you sort of rotate. So Gaussians that are correlated have this sort of property, which is the sort of way conceptually I like to think of them. Now that has an effect that I talked about earlier. So the multivariate consequence, if you're playing with multivariate Gaussians, and indeed this is what we just did, we applied a rotation to a axis aligned independent Gaussian D, um, so we sort of said uh, the new variable y is going to take something that was rotated around. And y is equal to wx. This is the thing I just mentioned at the beginning there. Then this is the case. That y is drawn from a Gaussian with w times mu as the mean and w sigma w transpose as the covariance. Knowing that rule allows you to derive like loads of models that are much more complex in theory when you first see them derived. Um, but it, it's a rule that applies to Gaussians because of the sum of Gaussian variables being Gaussian, sum of scaled Gaussian variables. So I want to introduce Gaussian processes. And we've introduced the multivariate Gaussian. So I tend to introduce Gaussian processes, and actually I was watching back. This, this introduction is strongly motivated by a talk I saw where David Mackay introduced Gaussian processes uh, in a school I organized 10 years ago in um, uh, Bletchley Park. Who's seen David Mackay's introduction to Gaussian processes? OK, the rest of you have to watch it. It's amazing. Fortunately, he died in April, which is very, very sad. But he's only five years older than me. But uh, he always seemed a lot older than that because he had an amazing way of introducing things. And that I, I watched that. Um, just shortly, I think, just shortly before or after he died, I watched that video again. If you search David Mackay, Introduction to Gaussian Processes, you'll find it. Um, it's on video lectures. It was a school we organized on Gaussian Processes about 10 years ago, and it's a great introduction. And my review is very much inspired by that. So um, I've been introducing multivariate Gaussian matrices as things that correlate between W and H, and you can think of them as somehow uh, rotating the system so that you, you're introducing these correlations on an independent system. That's very much the way I think about it. Um, I think about it like that because, by the way, it's inverting the principal components. So this turns out to be principal component analysis decomposition. This is the eigenvalue decomposition of the covariance matrix. Right? So in some sense, if we go back, I mean, the principal axes of this ellipse are the principal components, as defined by Hotelling, not Pearson. Pearson never talked about principal components. The principal axes of the ellipse are the principal components. So they involve a rotation and a scaling. The scaling are the uh, eigenvalues, which is the sigmas I spoke about, and R is the rotation. Or, um, so I like to think about the distribution in that way, but what I'm going to show you here is a sample from a multivariate Gaussian. Now, this is important. I think that this is, you have to try this yourself 
to really believe that this works. Who's sampled from a multivariate Gaussian in this way? Okay. It's, a, it's an incredible experience, I find, personally. I mean, it's one of the nicest things I've ever done in math. So um, if, you, if you take a multivariate Gaussian with a covariant structure of a particular form, which we'll talk about in a bit, and you take one sample from it, and this is important, this is one sample from a multivariate Gaussian distribution. It's not 25 because it's a vector y. It's a 25-dimensional sample, but it's one sample taken from this Gaussian. And what I've set up is because that this Gaussian has strong correlations in the covariance. So the covariance says the covariance is high if two things are related. Because of that, then the neighboring points are very strongly correlated. Then what you tend to get is any two points here pairwise are close together. OK? Now, also, it's saying something about how that correlation fades. With that. So this, is, this point is correlated to this one, this one, this one, this one. Actually, it's correlated to anything along here. But it, it's sort of dropping off the level of correlation towards zero. Um, then you actually what you see is a curvy line. Now, it's odd because most people expect when you sample from Gaussians, you see something jagged. This looks like smooth. Now, it's not a line because it's a discrete sample. It's only got 25 discrete points in it. This is a Gaussian distribution, not a process. But it's the starting point conceptually for the process. Um, I'm not going to say where that covariance matrix is going to come from. Very importantly, and sometimes I forget to emphasize this, the mean of the multivariate distribution I'm sampling from is zero. OK? The mean is zero. It's one sample. Of course, it's not along the zero line because there's no chance in a high dimensional Gaussian of getting a sample near the mean. That's something you should know, that the higher the dimensions, you tend to move away from the mean. So you will never see a sample at zero. You'll see things off zero. On average, these samples will be zero. But you start getting this curve forming here. Now, to explore that further, I want to go back to looking at marginals again, because we can plot marginals. So instead of white and height, I'm just going to plot the marginal of this one and this one. OK? F1 and F2, we'll call them, what their marginal distribution is. And they're very strongly correlated. The marginal distribution of a Gaussian process is actually really easy to compute. It's another amazing property. So normally, if I wanted the marginal distribution, I have to integrate out F3 to F25. And that's the headache again. High dimensional integrals are a headache. They're the Bain of Bayesian inference. But I now want to integrate out these things. Now, it turns out for the Gaussian, if I represent it in the form of the covariance, this comes up in the school as well. Why do you always use covariances? You know, um, and I think that there's, the best answer is, there's maybe you could give several different answers, and I have in the past. But I think my favorite answer that I think is indisputable is um, we use covariances uh, for two reasons. One is this trick I'm about to show you, the marginalization property. And the other is this central limit theorem, that the sum of Gaussian variables turns out to require the sum of the covariances. And that means that when we combine Gaussian processes together, we do it through the covariance. So there's many other more interpretable ways of looking at certain Gaussian processes, perhaps. You can argue, we can always argue that, that that's more interpretable, blah, blah, blah. That's because it's a subjective thing. But it is totally objective that the way to combine Gaussian processes, two different Gaussian processes, if you want to add them together, you've got one saying one thing and one saying another. You have to represent them in terms of their covariance at some point to bring them together. So I tend to think of it as, like I like to say, it's like the API of the Gaussian process. People who program, who here doesn't know what an API is? OK, so an API is an application programming interface. And it's defi definition for a computer program, how you interact with that program, how you make calls to it. So from a computer scientist perspective, the covariance function is, I mean, it's the same with the mean function. Mean functions add together. So the, but we're going to ignore mean functions for a large part. Jeremy may say that. Are you going to say it? Jeremy will say it, because he knew I was going to ignore them. Um, <laughs> Uh, the covariance function is like how you, if you want to combine two Gaussian processes, you need to ask it for its covariance function, ask the other for its covariance function, and then add them together. So that's a major reason why the covariance function turns out to be used. In this case, the covariance matrix is not a function yet, although it was generated from a function. So it turns out that the marginal distribution of two Gaussian variables is found 
simply by zooming in on the covariance for those two. This does not work for the inverse covariance. This does not work in any other distribution. This sort of never comes up. Uh, so this is slightly different color here. This is about point, as we'll see in a moment, I think this is 0.96. This is one on our color scale here. Um, the covariance between these two gives us the marginal distribution. Of course, it makes sense that's the case, or else you wouldn't be able to talk about correlation without thinking about other things that might be influencing it. I mean, that's why correlation is so fundamental. The relationship between covariance and correlation is that the correlation is just the normalized covariance, right? So it happens in this case, I've defined a covariance that is pre-normalized. So this is also a correlation matrix. So the covariance is a nice way of talking about things if you want to know how correlated two aspects are. But it also gives us the marginal distribution. Now, that is the form of the covariance matrix. But going back to our sort of picture before, what that gives us is a correlation, uh, well, a sort of an axis, a principal axis that is almost, is like 45 degrees almost, right, between the two variables. Um, and this is what it's saying between F1 and F2 of what we expect these joint variables to be. It's a very strong correlation, 0.96. But notice there's still some noise off it, right? If the correlation was 1, what would I expect to see here, by the way? Straight line. Yeah, it would be an indefinite Gaussian, actually. As the correlation would drive towards 1, its determinant would be 0. So, that, so indefiniteness is something that happens to Gaussian covariances, and it can happen numerically, even though if you know it's a, a full Gaussian. So as you drove this, but as you take the limit as this goes to 1, you would get a straight line here, just a Gaussian bump slice sticking out of the plane. Uh, sort of knife, a razor sharp Gaussian sticking out. So, what happens? Let's see. So, let's observe, make an observation. So, observation that F1 is minus 0.3, let's say. Okay? Now, machine learning or data driven analysis of any form is about making one observation and then making a prediction over something else. And that's what we're about to do. So, given this covariance between these two, what I've got is a joint distribution over F1 and F2. So I've got a model that tells me how F1 and relates to F2. So if I make an observation of what F1 is, I can now talk about what F2 might be. And for me, that is how all, that's the sort of gold standard way all modeling should be done. In practice, you often can't because of intractabilities. You do simpler things. You do deep neural networks and other crazy stuff. But what you really want to do is build a joint model over everything you're interested in condition on the things you've observed and get a joint prediction over those you've not observed. That's the ultimate. In fact, few people would dispute that, I think. But of course, there's many reasons why it's impractical. Where does your model come from? But here we've got our model, so we're going to do that. We've got a piece of training data that's F1, and we're going to make a prediction over what F2 is. Okay? So F2 is the conditional distribution. So the conditional distribution turns out, so I said before that marginal distributions for Gaussians can be thought of as looking at the Gaussian from two directions. The marginal distribution for F2. So I always think of Uluru, the, or Ayers Rock in Australia, this big lump that always has a member of the royal family standing in front of it in the pictures on the front page of the Daily Mail. Um, now, oh, there's hills, there are beautiful hills over there. We used to have a, a ski village on top of that hill, but uh, Europe's largest, but not anymore. So there, there's a hill over there, right, as well. If you look at that hill, you're looking at the sort of marginal distribution, right, from this side. Um, or if someone looks from right angles, they're looking at a different marginal. That's what you're looking at, something at bumping out of the plane here. Um, now, the conditional, though, if you want to think in that analogy what the conditional, or get the intuition of what the conditional is, it comes from slicing through the hill. Right? So we take a slice through the hill on F2 at our observational point. Right? So you can't do this to the actual Ayers Rock or Uluru. They'll arrest you. But um, if you were to do it, then you would get a profile of what the hill looks like at that point. If you renormalize that profile, you're recovering the conditional distribution. This is P of F2 given F1 in the red. This is the observation F1, and that was the original joint distribution. So this is the whole process of learning, in a nutshell, to me. Although we just think of it as probabilistic inference, which is why you, in uh, um, the world of non-Fisherians, those two terms are conflated, um, learning and inference. Because what you have is a model that you've defined. That includes your assumptions about the world. It's your equivalent of y equals mx plus c. It may have come 
from saying y equals mx plus c and then putting a distribution over m and c, but it doesn't have to. That's a classical likelihood prior way of doing it. It doesn't have to come that way. It may have done. Um, it's giving you the uh, relationship you expect between f1 and f2. You make an observation of f1, and then you make a prediction of f2 given f1. It's simple. Apart from, in practice, there's complications. But it's quite simple for Gaussians, fortunately. So the conditional distribution says that f2 should be somewhere in the negative quadrant because of the correlation. But it also recognizes that it might go either side. If the correlation was 100%, this conditioning would just lead to a delta function on the same observed value. Makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? But as the correlation is decreasing, you get an increase in the variance. Now, something that's perhaps slightly counterintuitive is how quickly that variance goes up. And so I'll show you that with a, okay, by first looking at the maths of how that comes about. I'm not deriving any of the maths I'm showing you because I'm trying to give you the intuitions. Um, what was it? Hopfield said at his NIPS talk, uh, maths is that something that should be, that it's like sex, it should be done uh, in private amongst consenting adults. Um, <laughs> so I quite like that, I quite like that. But um, of course we have to show some maths, but we're not going to do the proofs. I make my poor uh, master's students do proofs because I have to ask them questions in exam. And if you don't show them the proofs, they complain. Um, so, but you know, in, in a lecture like this, I, w I wouldn't tend to do proofs. I'll just give you the result. So it turns out that the conditional distribution, importantly, is also Gaussian. So this is very, very weird that like, you know, you've got the joint distribution, all its conditionals are Gaussian, all its marginals are Gaussian. This doesn't happen for other distributions. It's very weird. Um, the conditional distribution is of the form a Gaussian, and this is my notation for Gaussian, which lots of people use, the Gaussian distribution over F2. If, sometimes we just drop what it's over because it's obvious from this side, but here I've got it over F2. This term here is the mean, and this term here is the variance. But to try and rewrite that a little, oh no, I didn't rewrite it here, so I should have done. So this is the mean of the resulting Gaussian, and this is the variance. Now it's quite intuitive, actually, if this is the covariance, which in our case is a correlation because I've set k11 and k22 to be 1, makes the math up here a little bit easier. The mean is going to be the correlation, which was 0.96, times f1. So the mean is going to be 0 0.96 times minus 0.313, which was the observation. And the variance is going to be 1, because we set that to 1, minus 0.96 squared over 1. So what happens is we've got strong correlation. Obviously, if this was 1, if this were 1, 1, then we would get the mean is equal to 1 over 1 times f1, which would be f1. And the covariance, would, the variance would be 1 minus 1 squared over 1, which would be 0. That would be the delta function. But here, what we've got is 0.96 squared. So it's going to be what's that, about 0.9 or something like that over 1. So we're going to get a variance of 1 minus 0.1, which would be about 0.9. That's the variance. The standard deviation is the square root of that. Now, the effect that has, if we go to something, I should stop and say, any questions there, actually, because I don't stop and often do that. Any questions about that? We, we can do, do feel free to interrupt with questions. What I want to do, though, is go back to, um, I should have spent longer making you ask a question, but I'll do that in a moment. Um, what about the correlation between one and five? So now we now just need, the row 1 and row 5 to get that distribution. And I'm going to do the same thing, but I'm going to do it for 1 and 5. So I'm going to assume we're observing f5 instead of observing f1. The correlation between f5 turns out to be 0.57. Now notice how quickly that Gaussian's ballooned up. And what that's going to do to the... You, some of you should be already be able to think, well, probably you wouldn't be able to think, but we'll come back to it, um, what the variance of the conditional is going to be. So now when we slice through and we look at the variance of F5 given F1, we get something that's much broader. So no longer, although this correlation is quite good in some sense, if we were doing some sort of social science study and we wanted to know people correlation between here and here, we get quite excited. We've got a result, correlation, you know, um, something like that. Uh, we, if we had a sort of statistical significance, it seems high, it's actually very weak in terms of interrelating these variables. So indeed, even in the plot before, when we sampled, when we actually observed what the F5 was in that curve before, which is what these red crosses are representing, it's not even in the same half space as F1. So it's quite a long way away from F1. I mean, you'd 
in fact, you'd be hard pushed to really distinguish much between that on a couple of, how many observations would you need to distinguish between this distribution and just a standard normal? Quite a few, I suspect. I don't know, I'm not expert in statistical power and hypothesis testing. But this distribution is very broad. So one thing that is typically, I think, not in people's intuitions, and maybe why covariances aren't always as intuitive as you might expect, is that as these correlations drop off between variables, you actually get quite a loose relationship, which is why very often when you sample from Gaussian distributions, you don't see such tight. All, all the sort of interesting stuff happens when the correlations are very high, it seems to me. Now, in general, we don't actually make typically, well, I would love it if the world had data sets where you had a model and one observation and had to make one prediction. But in generally, we don't do that. We have to extend the multivariate Gaussian. And what we might get, and I haven't said where the covariance is coming from yet. I'll probably only finish on where the covariance is coming from um, so as not to overrun. But what we generally have is the same sort of formula that says the conditional distribution for some set of unobserved f. So if we had a test set, we might call it on machine learning, or a number of variables where we want to make prediction, f star, and we are given a number of variables as our training set, or what we want to condition on, as f, then in general, the multivariate Gaussian conditional has this form. So it's a little bit more complicated. And this one I do, I think, have it split into the mean and covariance. And these are the formula for Gaussian process learning, basically. Um, these are the key formulae that underpins everything. Once you're given k, which is the covariance or the kernel, the covariance matrix that we'll look at next, then it's very clear what you do because you've made a joint Gaussian assumption. And this, what you do is you get a mean which is equal to the cross covariance between between your test data and your training data times the inverse of the covariance for your training data times f, your set of observations. And that's the mean of your prediction. The covariance of your prediction uh, has, starts as the prior covariance and then subtracts k star f times kff inverse times kf star. So this is a sort of the cross correlation again between the two. So in multivariate, it also works. It's just less interpretable about what's going on. And this is what you get your predictions from. So if you've made an observation f, then you make predictions with mu in terms of your mean prediction. That's your, well, make predictions with mu. Depends what your objective function is, actually your costs are. But that would be, if you wanted to make a mean prediction, you use this formula. And then this formula shows you how things correlate around that mean, what the uncertainties are. So let me pause, because I think I did that bit. I'm not sure I did that bit very well. but. Um, let me pause there and ask questions about what I'm saying here. Let me go back to this sort of plot and see if there were questions people had at this time when I should have stopped about what I'm doing here and what it led to. Any questions? Jeremy will explain it all clearer later, but just, you know, questions. I sense questions. I know. But just, you know, it's a good way of wasting time just standing here. There we go. So uh, the horizontal axis uh, shows the 25 di uh, dimensions, and the, um, uh, the vertical axis is showing the covariance correlation sure. between. Um, on this act, yes, on this plot, the horizontal is showing the 25 dimensions. And the, the matrix here is showing the correlation between them. On this, we're just showing the value sample from the Gaussian. So we've got the dimensions here. So I've got a, a vector. And these dimensions are just the dimensions of the vector. I've ordered them in this way. That ordering dictates how this plot appears. And these values here are the values I just get from a one line sample. So in MATLAB, this would be um, you build your covariance, you put it in C. And then what would it be? I can't remember the command for something from Gaussian in MATLAB. It would be like, um, fun? Rand n. Well, yeah, but if you do it Rand n, you have to do it Rand n. And then you'd have to say dimension 25. And then you would have to know, you would have to do a Kolesky decomposition on that, <laughs> multiply by the Kolesky decomposition. 
and then there's no mean. So um, yeah, it's not the most intuitive way of doing it, which is actually, you know how we were saying earlier, you build the Gaussian covariance by rotating the space. The way you get underlying multivariate Gaussian samples is you sample from round n independently, and then you multiply by the affine transformation. So that's why you do the Kolesky. Um, I think in, uh, what is it in, uh, so I think in um, Python, it's like multivariate normal, which is written out all the way out. And then you say um, mean, uh, I can't remember how you even say, whether you say mean or whatever, let's say you say mean equals, and then you put a vector of zeros in, and then you say covariance equals C. But then you say, the important thing is you say samples, I can't even remember the key name for that, is equal to one, one sample only, one sample. Um, not 25 samples. And so then you get a 25 dimensional vector or whatever the dimension of mean and covariance was. This covariance is covariance and then the mean is zero. Um, and then we're just plotting those along this line. Other questions? You said normally we're not interested in the mean. Mm. Um, if I know that there's some form of linear trend, um, yeah. is that putting a prior on my linear trends equivalently, or is it the data then reshaped? So I've had uh, some really interesting discussions about this, which has led me to something present a view that I think would be consistent between what Jeremy would do and what I would do. And, but to do that, I'm going to go all the way back to here. Um, yes. If you're a statistician, very often you believe in this model and you want to know what M is. Because you want to go into a doctor and you want to say, uh, we're seeing you know, some, this increase in heart disease due to um, smoking. Right? Because you need to be able to, the, a key difference between statisticians and machine learners is, is statisticians typically have to explain why their answers are coming from. Because someone's going to make a decision that people's lives depend upon. That's the whole sort of point in mathematical statistics. But in, in, in mathematical statistics, in spatial modeling, remember this corruption we talked about here. So what you see, I think pretty much a load of classes of spatial models can be seen as having this model here and then saying this corruption is drawn from a spatial Gaussian process, which is not independent. So least squares comes from assuming independence across these points here. But if you're building a spatial model, so we're trying to work out um, disease across Sheffield or something like that, then typically you get noise that's spatially correlated. And then you model it as spatially correlated noise. So statisticians tend to come on, uh, upon Gaussian processes, or some class of, of statisticians would do, spatial geostatisticians, will very often come up across them as this being a nuisance parameter that you're trying to get rid of that's spatially distributed, but you want all the modeling to be done in M and C. So if you, I mean, I, th I think you have to be very cautious about knowing about linear trends, linear in particular, because linear trends tend to saturate outside the range of the data. And if your model's purely predictive, that would be the machine learner's perspective, and you've forced a linear trend in there, that is going to extrapolate into regions where you've never seen data before. So the machine learner's perspective would be, don't put that linear trend in there, because that's going to cause, as you move away from the data, it's going to cause you to make crazy predictions you have no right to make. It's valid, like it's on the spring, on Hooke's law. It's like saying, well, it will continue as I pull this spring to be linear, which we all know it won't, right? The spring will break and catch your eye out. Um, I suppose so you don't get data in that region. Um, <laughs> So the machine learner would be like, no, don't do that. Put all the modeling stuff in here and don't force linear trends or let the data speak. But it's a difference in philosophy, and both are correct according to what they're doing and according to what they want out of the model. So a statistician is very often trying to sort of say that this parameter is meaningful in some way. Would you say that's true, Jeremy? Or? Uh, part of it, yes. Part of it's true. It's partially true. If you're a non-Fisherian, anything can only be partially true because of the sustained uncertainty. <laughs> okay, this is the bad idea about PDF animations. Uh, other questions? Uh, in the last thing you say, the first assumption you made is the sum of the two Gaussians is a Gaussian. Yeah. But in fact, the sum of two Gaussians is not a... Uh, some of the samples from a Gaussian. Some of the samples from the Gaussian. It's not a Gaussian mixture model? No. Um, if you, um, that's a different thing, right? A Gaussian mixture model comes from when I have two Gaussians. 
it looks like a sum of Gaussians. That's the sum of the PDFs. So why your confusion is coming in is I add the PDFs of Gaussians, I have a mixture model. But that's not what the sum of the dis, uh, samples from that distribution come out. So mixture models come about from a probabilistic way of switching between two Gaussians. So I give two Gaussians to one of each of you at the front, and then I flip a coin as to who I ask. I never add the things they say. Yeah? I only take one or the other. So I'm now sampling here, now sampling there. And so mixture model left, component left is that one, component right is that one. And so I either get something from here or something from here. I never add those things. Now the PDF of that is of the form of the sum of two Gaussians. Right? But that is not the same. In fact, one horrible nightmare about probability distributions is the sum of things sampled from the distribution is not easily resolved. You have to use the characteristic function and uh, convolution and various things. So it's never trivial. Never trivial. It's trivial in the Gaussian case. It's not normally so trivial to talk about what the um, distribution over two summed variables is, um, which is why central limit theorem is so important, because a lot of uh, classical statistics is about trying to make sure you're measuring something which provably is leading you to the central limit theorem. Um, yeah. Is that clear? Other questions? Yeah, it's really interesting that actually, because um, they are they are basically zero. Numerically, they're zero here, but in actuality, they're non-zero because um, of the way I happen to have computed them, which I haven't talked about. It just means that as you get far enough away, you get independence. It's the sort of thing you rely on from a Markov property. Now, actually, strictly speaking, this example here is not Markovian. Uh, it's actually every single point is correlated to every other because this doesn't quite go to zero. But you can build Gaussian models, as we'll look at when I next speak, which are Markovian as well. So it just means that the, uh, by that point, that is pretty much independent once you get down to here of this one. We even saw for the fifth data point that they're not looking that close. Once you get to here, these things are independent. Now, of course, it happens they've landed in the same place. That's coincidence. But the correlation says they're independent. The true model. Yeah, I suppose uh, where I'm getting a bit confused perhaps is basically uh, when we talk about, let's say, Euclidean distance, so we have two data points and the Euclidean distance is basically what we can do with the bit. Whereas this is sort of like intra covariance between the dimensions of a single solution or a data yeah. point. Yeah. So that's where I'm getting a bit good where you're getting confused because that's the transition you need to go through that confusion yeah normally we don't think about the models in that way um, normally we make an IID assumption normally we say given some parameters things are independent um, which is why it's a little bit hard I think when you first see Gaussian process because you're not saying that you're saying um, they've got a correlation between them within the data not within the features which often we do when we fit Gaussians but within the data. So, it could, I mean, it certainly took me a while to understand the implications of that when I was first looking at GPs. I guess I heard about GPs in about 96 because I was at Aston with Chris Williams and I remember David Barber talking about them quite early on. He gave a really good intuitive. I saw Chris Williams speak about them. I saw David Mackay speak about them. Um, I think it's actually only when you start playing around with them and implementing them that you really start to understand. You get a sense, oh, that's nice, but... <laughs> it's a little bit alien. Um, that probably didn't help because I said, yes, you should be confused. <laughs> um, when you hear Jeremy, you'll fully understand it. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, so what we haven't said is, um, I said we were going to do regression problems. They have inputs. Uh, we haven't said where the inputs are going in. And of course, the inputs are actually going into the covariance function. So then the next thing I want to sort of say is, well, how does x? So I would tend to think, I call this f. The reason I call this f is because we're modeling a function, f of x. So much of machine learning can be drawn down to modeling a function. Or if you're doing surrogate modeling, that's very often what you're trying to do. The sort of thing that Jeremy does in uh, computer code modeling is you run a large scale simulation of um, the climate 
you set its parameters according to this, and then the output is two degrees warmer in 100 years. And then you emulate that with this function, right? And that's what we're trying to estimate here. So that's why I use f, because it's the function. I would use y if I've corrupted that function and into, by adding noise to it. So we've got the f, so where's the x gone? Well, the x can only be really in this, because I'm not using mean functions, but Jeremy will. The x can only really be in there. So this is a covariant matrix. It's discrete. F was a vector. It's discrete. Now, from an engineer's perspective, if you just make the vector infinite length, and then put the elements of the vector, index them instead of by a discrete number, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 25, a continuous variable, that's a function. So I say an engineer's perspective because my undergraduate is mechanical engineering. So, um, <laughs> um, so f of x, you know, f as a vector is just a series of numbers, 2, 2.2, 2.3, 2.4. And then it's a discrete function, right? Because this is element one, element two, element three, element four. That's a lookup table, right? So it's not a function because it's not real valued. It's got discrete values. So the engineer's perspective is, ah, well, you know, actually continuity doesn't really exist. It's a mathematical approximation. So um, if I just sort of increase, if I make the gap between these indices smaller and smaller and smaller and increase the length of this vector to infinite, then the vector becomes a function. And, and, you know, conceptually, that's what you're doing with the Gaussian process. If you actually want to prove stuff about that, you have to go to Martingales and Kolmogorov and all this stuff to show it's consistent to do that. I am not going to do that um, because I'm not sure it helps you use these models in practice. But it's certainly good stuff, interesting math stuff, uh, if you want to look at it. So the same with this covariance matrix. It's a discrete, it's a bivariate function with two inputs, right? It's, you know, K11, K12. Uh, K21, K12, so on and so forth. It's a bivariate symmetric function. Um, and actually, if we want it to be a covariance function, what we need is some way of generating according to our continuous index. And this is what I did to generate this. So I just took discrete indexes, x, I set it from 1 to 25. And then I've just computed the Euclidean distance between the two indices. So if it's 1 and 1, it's 0. If it's 1 and 2, it's... Um, uh, 1. 1 minus 2 is minus 1 squared, you know, distance of 1 squared stays with 1. And then I put in a length scale. The length scale de declares how long these correlations are occurring over. So the, um, the longer the length scale, the longer the correlations occur. So this value stays small if L is large or if the distance between x and x prime, two separate observations, is small. And then I'm taking the negative and exponentiating. So if this was 0, this would be 1, alpha times 1. So for the matrix above, I set alpha to 1. I can't remember what I set L to. So if it's the same, you're getting 1s along the diagonal. And then the length scale is set in such a way such that the correlation sort of falls off. Now what that means is, oh, let me just pause there and check if there's a question. I'm going to have to stop in a minute. What would be, uh, sorry, yes, good question. Alpha would be the scale of the function. So if I set alpha to 1, then two standard deviations would be plus 2, minus 2. It's giving me the mar it gives me the marginal values here. So if I want to know marginally where I expect it to do without any other knowledge, alpha is setting that. So often we call that the, the variance parameter, because it's giving you the variance of the function um, for these stationary covariances. Yeah. So it's sort of one is scaling in the functions like that way and the other scales them like that way. Other questions? I'll just briefly show you sort of overview of how then we get a matrix out of that because I think that's sort of important. So in practice, we just get data, right? We're given some set of data. We're giving data set points. Oh, we've got three potential places where we're going to observe the function. Maybe they're training or test. I don't even know. But let's just say... We've got x1 is minus 3, x2 is 1.2, and x3 is 1.4. And I've set L to be 2 and alpha 1. Now, if I want the elements of that matrix, I have this as like my machine for creating the matrix, right? It's my function. So I implement that in a bit of Python or R or whatever I like. 
Um, oh. Oh, I've lost all my. Oh, my dear. Oh, dear lordy. Um, OK, so um, I won't I won't dig out because we've only got a couple of minutes there. So what I do is um, I can always go through that if you want me to in the next lecture. I've somehow lost all the uh, follow on slides from that, which is really weird. Um, what I do is I substitute in x1 and x2 to fill in the matrix. So normally what I said is, OK, normally you've got a matrix, which is um, well, let me just try and draw it on the board. Normally, you've got a matrix, which would be a three by three here. So three rows and three columns. And then I've got this function here. If I want to fill in this matrix, I've got x1. To compute here, I've got x1 is minus, minus three. So I look at the square distance between x1 and itself, and I get it as zero. And then so I just end up putting in a one here. To get this element here, I need to compute the distance between x1 and x2 inside here. So normally, we would have a matrix where we've just got some indices, right? The mapping between those indices and the continuous idea of the function comes associated with the fact that every data point comes with an index, right? Now, the mapping between the data point and that index is arbitrary. We set it up as we like. So before, I was just substituting the index in to get this formula out. But normally, we would have a value of an observation, an input observation. And that's what gives us the covariance matrix. So from that, I can compute a matrix like this. That's my input. Now, it won't be exactly like this. And the whole point in the next bit was to show you what those matrices might look like in practice. Because there might be a whole, it wouldn't look so structured as this. It would be given the data you have. And then I've got a K that I can combine to make predictions over F. And so my X comes in to define the Gaussian process, the covariance function. Um, and my F is the output from it. I think I wasn't super clear on that. So we'll just take a few questions on that. And I may come back to it uh, when I talk again. But Jeremy may clear it all up anyway. Um, so questions there. Don't know what happened to my slides. Yeah. Sorry, going back to the sample taken from the samples. Yeah. Um, so the samples themselves are not... No, it's, it's it about, refer to it as a sample. So just uh, then ask the question again. So it's not 25 different samples. It's one sample that's 25 dimensional. That's really important. Yeah. Yeah. I keep saying that, but no one will ever listen. I, I know. I mean, it's, and it happens again. You're not, you know, it's not you. It's just a sort of thing. People just can't believe you can do, you know, why would you do that? That's the, that's the transition. You know, the function is a correlated sample. It's a thing. Every function is one sample. Yeah. Not infinite. It's one f sample from a Gaussian process, right? That's really, really important. And you're not used to that because you're not used to seeing people talk about data in the way. You're talk used to people saying IID, that we'll have. What you're used to seeing people talk about is sampling noise. It's so uninteresting. You know, the main thing, what IID means is noise, right? It's that epsilon we had at the beginning that Laplace described. So normally, you say that noise is IID. And then you write down a likelihood where conditioned on the parameters your data is independent. But think about what you're saying there. If you were genuinely saying your data was independent, then the whole thing would be pointless. Because I could know nothing about one data point given another. So if I say my data is independent, we, we never think about this properly, because I, I think it's taught in this way for simplicity. But um, we never think about what it means to say ID. It is not an assumption about your model. It's about an assumption about the difference between your model and the real world when you say IID. And that's really, really important. Now, when you do Gaussian processes, you don't make that assumption. You make the assumption that everything is correlated together. So you never write down I, that you can sum over all these data points, which gives you some headaches. Other questions? So the way that correlation is formed is dependent on the covariance function, which I didn't describe very well, I'm afraid, because of loss of some weird loss of slides. This is your model. This is the fundamentals of your model for this case. And what we're going to hear about later on from Nicola is different covariance functions you can use. I mean, so the mechanics of what I've just told you now, we'll, we'll break now, but um, the mechanics of what I just told you now is, is kind of uninteresting, right? Because it's just, if you give me a model and you give me some data, 
that's how I make predictions. Now you need to know that, I need to understand that and have intuitions about it. But the whole point in modeling, whether you're a data scientist, whether you're in uh, uncertainty quantification or whatever else, is understanding what assumptions you're putting into the data. Yeah? And where are those assumptions coming in so far? Where are the modeling assumptions coming in? Someone tell me. What assumptions have we made? The kernel function, that's one, yeah. So here we're making assumptions about how the correlations between points are falling off according to a given length scale and what the overall scale of the function is. What other assumption have we made? Multivariate Gaussian. We've assumed that all our observations can be modeled as a joint Gaussian distribution. Someone give me an example of a case where that's just going to be totally rubbish. Yeah, yeah. Frustrating. Most of the time it is Gaussian, so they make profits for 10 years and then, then you get a financial collapse and it isn't Gaussian. People do stupid things like leaving their economic community and uh, everything drops off the scale. So, yeah, financial data, but financial data is irritating because day to day it, it is pretty Gaussian or some of it is log Gaussian in some sense. Yeah, that's, but what's the characteristic of that that is causing it to be non Gaussian? Fat tails. Fat tails. Fat tails is a big one, discreteness. So, fat tails, and I mean, you can do things with Gaussian process where you deal with a discontinuity like that if you know it's coming. But, you know, people don't know, well, you know. They don't typically, if it does that and then it goes up again, that would be like a non, that would be a non-Gaussian because what, if you look at the joint distribution between the aspects of this function, it might be Gaussian in this region here, but then that's non-Gaussian. And then you have to look at things like Levy processes to deal with that. Now, why don't we, why isn't this a school about Levy processes then? Someone explain why we're not talking about Levy processes. Yeah, well, specifically, you can't write down their likelihood. <laughs> the Gaussian process is a special case of a Levy process where you can write down the likelihood. They turn out to be, we were talking about the sum of distributions before, the sum of multivariate, sorry, over there, multivariate distributions. They turn out to be the sum of two processes, one of which is a Gaussian process and one of which is a jump process. I think there's another term I'm forgetting as well in there. And just by doing that, just by saying, I've got a Gaussian process as my observation, plus a jump process, everything becomes intractable. It's a nightmare. And, and people do study them. They're quite well studied, but they're not that well deployed because they're difficult to implement on a computer. And a lot of what we're trying to do is get something that's easy to implement on a computer. So your modeling assumptions in real life are compromised by your need to implement it on a computer. Your ability to express the model in a simple enough mathematical form that you can do the, relative inf the, re the relevant inference. Gaussian processes really stick out in the zone of being a very powerful model for which inference is almost trivial. And that's why they're interesting. Not because they're always correct. I mean, you can sit there and meeting after meeting and people will say, well, you know, not everything's always Gaussian. It's true. But, you know, it's much easier to start with a Gaussian process very often and then try and develop it because you get so much power with the GP in the first place. Um, but there are many, many situations where they don't apply. So um, I'll stop there and uh, Jeremy's going to cover everything else. Um, <laughs> I do. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so final question before coffee? Any final? No? So say that again, sorry? So count data, for example. Count data. So if I'm looking at sequencing data, for example, um, from RNA seq, for example, then this sensibly to, even though, you know, statistician will tell you... Oh, Depends how big the count data is, right? So if counts go high enough, so what's, what, what does the sum of a set of Poissons converge to? Gaussian. Gaussian, yeah. It's, it's, I mean, they actually, they stay Poisson, <laughs> but it starts looking Gaussian because uh, they're related to the binomial, I think, as well. So the, if I've got a, a series of Poisson rates and I'm adding them all together, so if counts are high, it looks very Gaussian in terms of the likelihood. Um, and you, but you, it's, it's still wrong, but you can approximate it well by Gaussian. And I think that that's in... So count data, I think in uh, sequencing, for example, you might be looking at things like negative binomials and things like that. If they're low counts, then it's a little bit tricky. 
you have to start using approximations. So Gaussian processes are kind of trivial and elegant for many different reasons. But the, the headaches are as follows. Number one, you have to do a matrix inverse, or you know, even if it were matrix multiplication, it's the same difficulty, in the size of your training data. If that is n, if that's a million, then you have to invert a million by a million matrix. You won't even fit that in your computer. It won't happen. So in the most general form, you can't do that. So you have to do either approximations, or you build classes of specific Gaussian process models, like Kalman smoothers, for which that inverse is tractable for reasons that we can't see in this form. Um, that's, so that's one area. You've got massive data. The other area is when things become non-Gaussian, like count data. And depending on how trivial that is, so the classical solution for that is to build generalized linear models with Gaussian processes underpinning them. So to use link functions and likelihoods um, in order to try and map the data into a domain where you've got it as a Gaussian process again. Even that sometimes isn't sufficient. So that's one type of non-Gaussianity. Another type of non-Gaussianity is this. The actual process itself has heavy tails. So this is the, um, oh, what's the guy who wrote the Black Swan book? Yeah, yeah. Nassim Taleb, yeah, yeah. That's like the black swan thing. I mean, it's a... I, th I kind of think... I mean, I've read little bits of what he says, and I just think it's not true that people don't take that into account. It's like, people do, but it's hard to deal with, you know. It's, um, this is your black swan moment. Uh, but in, in, in learning, we would say it's just a non-parametric discontinuity, Yeah. It's not a black swan moment. It's a non-parametric discontinuity. The challenge is combining a non-parametric discontinuity with a, an underlying Gaussian process in a way that's tractable. We can envisage these models. It's whether we can do inference in them or not that is the sort of question. So sometimes we then look to try and approximate a Gaussian process to that sort of thing. That's the sort of thing you might do. So massive limitations on the model, but the limitations are way less than many other models. They're very flexible framework. Okay, let's, uh, let's really stop there for um, coffee.